This portion of the course, we're going to be looking at clinical decisions regarding periodontal disease from a radiographic standpoint. I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a veterinary dentist, and this is our first patient. We've all seen him. Small breed dog, middle to upper middle age that's never really had an adequate cleaning and evaluation in the hospital. Very commonly what we see is profound disease in these small breeds. You can see here there's considerable calculus, there's uh, debris into the tissue and around the, the tissue. Just profound disease present. And radiographically what we're going to find is significant bone destruction. We can see here the representation of the calculus on the crown and then profound bone destruction around all these teeth. Now there's not much of a decision that needs to be made on this patient. The approach is to extract all the teeth that are affected and in this case it looks like every tooth is profoundly affected. Now the question becomes when we've got this much mandibular bone destruction, are we going to come back after we've done the extractions, especially in these locations here where the ventral cortex is close to the apical extent of the bone destruction adjacent to the distal root on this left mandibular first molar, and again here on both roots of the right mandibular first molar. So when we're looking at utilizing bone grafts, we have to take into consideration what we're actually doing and what we're trying to accomplish. <clears throat> Once bone grows back into these defects, which it will, regardless of whether we use a bone graft or not, that bone is going to be considerably strong based upon the use of that, that bone itself. This is not a weight-bearing bone. It's not a bone that is likely to sustain a significant trauma of any type going forward in this little dog's life. So utilizing a bone graft here would maybe provide an extra millimeter or two as an end result coronally, but as far as the relative stability of this mandible goes, that's not going to be an issue. And if we put a bone graft in here and it takes six to eight weeks for that bone to organize where it's structurally sound, that interim period between now and the time that that bone forms doesn't provide us any significant stability. It's still as if there, were, there was a defect there. So when making that consideration with this type of defect in the mandible, I generally do not use a bone graft. Now, take into consideration what we're seeing here. This is the maxillary uh, view of this uh, dog and you can see the bone loss adjacent to the incisors here. So if I'm going to extract these two teeth due to the periodontal destruction here, this is past 50% of the root length, so this is a this is stage four here. This is definitely stage four periodontal disease here. <clears throat> then upon extraction, we've we're left with a defect that if it's if we don't utilize a bone graft, then we've got the potential and a very predictable potential that this bone level will drop one to two millimeters over the next year and leave these roots with less bone than they would if we could place a bone graft here which maximizes alveolar bone height upon healing. So in a case where you've got especially short rooted teeth like these incisors and the bone between the extraction site and the remaining teeth is thin like you see here then the decision to make a bone graft is a little easier to make. So I would use either console or Synergy. Uh, Fusion is a, another product that 
uh, is made by uh, Veterinary Transplant Services that is also um, uh, more of a putty type material, but it's a little bit of an overkill for, for this because it is an osteoinductive material. So it's more expensive. It has born, uh, bone morphogenic proteins included within the graft, which help to draw cells into the graft to facilitate bone growth. So that's a little bit overkill. I would stick with something like console or uh, synergy in a, in a defect like this. And what that's going to allow us to do is overfill this defect slightly so that we have, um, set, if we have settling, we will end up with that bone graft at the level of the marginal bone and consequently have a better chance of maintaining that marginal bone level when all this heals. Now there is a picture of, in this case, synergy in the defect and our result can be predictably that the marginal bone level will be maintained at least uh, partially um, versus a bone graft, or I'm sorry, versus a uh, blood clot. Now, in this scenario, we've got a defective developmental change in the distal root, and if you could see the rest of the x-ray in the mesial root of this first molar. So if we extract this tooth, even though we're extracting adjacent to the second molar here on the left mandible, we've got considerable bone depth between the extraction site and this tooth. So utilizing a bone graft here wouldn't provide much of, of a benefit in that when if, if there is that bone loss that we expect, if we just maintain this with a blood clot, it's going to be more in a pattern like this and would not affect this tooth because there's too much distance between the extraction site and the tooth itself. So I would not use a bone graft in that case. This is a similar case, just not as profound, this patient had received dental cleanings periodically throughout its life and unfortunately no radiographic studies were done with this patient. When we look at the radiographs of the left rostral mandible, you can see that there's stage four bone loss periodontal disease adjacent to these premolars and that's pretty much consistent throughout the, the mouth of this patient. Now, there's, there's decisions to be made when we look at near total destruction of bone around a, a multitude of teeth, and then we have some teeth that aren't quite as affected, or maybe some that are even close to normal. <clears throat> In all cases, I think it's important for us to look at client education from the standpoint of this patient has three, four teeth left, they will eventually probably progress down the same road to bone destruction. We can get this patient back every six months and clean uh, an anesthetic episode for those four teeth, but it might be better, especially since a lot of times the four teeth that are left are non-functional and don't help with the mastication process to go ahead and extract those teeth and leave the patient edentulous and then we don't have any maintenance going forward and I, I think it's really important that we talk to the owners about that let them know that that's a that's a possibility that's an option and that um, it's probably the best option and many choose and I would go as far as to say most choose uh, to have that done so this is, again, the same patient. If you look here, we've got um, bone loss down past the 50% root coverage. And we also have an increase in the periodontal ligament space width here as well. So in this particular case, what we could do is we could extract this um, abnormal second molar, which has root dilaceration here. Uh, to the point of a total convergence. We have questionable lucencies here. This might be a periapical lucency, or you, you have to look at the dereculation of the bone around here. This may or may not be uh, a periapical lucency. Same thing here. Uh, that may or may not be significant. 
Uh, it's a little bit too subtle to call, but the important thing here is this tooth needs to be extracted, and we could certainly do curatage to eliminate the soft tissue in this defect, come back with a bone graft, and close and expect that bone to regrow. Now, the other thing that we need to take into consideration is there may be bone loss uh, adjacent to one or both the lingual or vestibular aspect of that tooth root down to this level. And if so, there's a potential that we could regrow bone there. Um, but you, you need to really look once you've opened this up and cleaned this out to see if that's more extensive. It could extend down well below what it appears to look here because we're looking at superimposition of three different structures. You've got the root, you've got the lingual bone, you've got the uh, vestibular bone that superimpose upon each other. So your clinical impression based on opening that tissue up and looking is going to make decisions whether you're going to try to save that tooth or not. If the bone is uh, uh, on one surface of the root is down in this level, uh, it may be best to extract that. If all the bone adjacent there is up around this level or uh, some is gone on either side but you still have a defect there that results in a moat and a normal marginal bone, then that certainly would be amenable to doing uh, some bone grafting, uh, plus or minus a membrane on top of that. And when we talk about membranes, we, we refer to mainly in our hands uh, doxyrobe, which right now is not available uh, for the most part. But doxyrobe is a membrane that prevents that epithelial downgrowth where the epithelium tries to come into this defect and <clears throat> dislodge the bone and create a pocket and result in failure of the attempt to grow new bone, uh, to grow new cementum on this, on this root and reestablish that periodontal ligament space. So <clears throat> we generally use a bone graft again with a barrier membrane on top of that, uh, most, mostly being um, doxyrobe. Same patient, all those teeth in uh, clinical practice would need to be extracted. And when we're talking about extraction on these cases, we're not just talking about removing the teeth. In this patient, what we're going to do is we're going to come up and we're going to create a flap that extends the length of the quadrant that we're working on. And we're going to extract all these teeth and we're going to remove all this debris. And you can see if we just extract those teeth what we're leaving. Um, it, it's not in the patient's interest to just leave all this disease because the disease itself, not the tooth, is the problem. So once we've extracted these, we can go in, we can use a burr, uh, generally a football diamond burr, clean this up, resulting in no disease left, and then suture the gingiva back to the palatal mucosa. And we do that in all four quadrants. There you have the maxilla, uh, same side, where we've cleaned all that up. We've got a nice uh, margin here and a nice margin here that will suture uh, quite nicely back together. And there's the end result after uh, healing. That's probably uh, 30 days or so uh, after the procedure. Same thing on the mandible. Hi, I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a veterinary dentist. The course that you just previewed is available for full registration on the link below this video. If you click on the registration link, it will allow you full access to this race accredited course anytime, anywhere, and as many times as you'd like to watch. Hope you enjoy. Thank you.